All right, well, welcome everybody to uh, the Lowy Institute and welcome to this conversation about Australian defence policy and AUKUS with uh, uh, Charles E. Dell, Levina Lee and Justin Burke. I'm Sam Rogovine, Director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute. I'll introduce our panel more formally in a moment, but as is customary, we begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Well, it's no exaggeration to say that AUKUS has dominated the news here in Australia since President Biden and Prime Ministers Albanese and Sunak made their joint announcement in San Diego last Tuesday morning, our time. Australia, it was announced, will acquire three to five secondhand Virginia-class nuclear powered attack submarines from the US, and then eight new generation submarines designed and built with US and UK help to be known as SSN AUKUS. And incidentally, SSN is the accepted short form for nuclear-powered submarines. It's a term you might hear frequently from our panellists today. It stands for Ship Submersible Nuclear. The three leaders also announced uh, Submarine Rotational Force West. From as early as 2027, the UK will rotate one SSN through the newly refurbished HMAS Stirling Naval Base in Western Australia, while the US will contribute four. It's fair to say that the announcement also came with a large dose of what marketing and advertising experts refer to as sticker shock, which is that shudder and lightheadedness that we all feel when we see a large number on a price tag. In this case, an estimated 268 to $368 billion Australian over 30 years. So the job for our panelists this afternoon is to discuss the merits of that spending, what sort of military equipment and how much military deterrence will Australia get for its investment? That's at least where we'll start this conversation, but I'll also throw the floor open to all of your questions uh, later in the session. For now, let me introduce our panellists. Charles E. Dell is the inaugural Australia Chair at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC, one of America's most renowned think tanks. He previously taught at the University of Sydney, where he was a senior fellow at the US Study Centre, uh, prior to that, he was a professor of strategy and policy at the U.S. Naval War College and served on the U.S. Secretary of State's policy planning staff from 2015 to 2017. Welcome back to Sydney, Charlie. Uh, Dr. Lavina Lee is a senior lecturer in the Department of Security Studies and Criminology at Macquarie University. In 2020, she was appointed to the Council of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Lavina is a non-resident fellow and thus a colleague of Charlie at CSIS and a non-resident senior fellow at the US Study Centre in Sydney. Prior to joining Macquarie University, she was a political risk consultant with Control Risks Group. And last but not least, Justin Burke is the 2000, uh, 2022 Michael and Deborah Thorley Scholar in International Security at the Lowy Institute. He's also a non-resident fellow at Kiel University in Germany. Justin's completing a PhD at Macquarie University on the uses of submarines in naval diplomacy. He has written for the Royal Australian Navy's Sea Power Centre and other scholarly publications, and he appears regularly in print and online in Australia and internationally. And I'm going to take the opportunity, Justin, to begin with you as our, as our true submarine expert on the panel today. Uh, I want to ask, what, what is it that... Uh, well, we, we, we hear nuclear-powered submarines described as the apex predators of the ocean. So tell us a little bit more about their capabilities. What is Australia getting? What will Australia be able to do that it has never been, been able to do before? Um, thank you for the question, Sam. Um, also, allow me to thank you uh, for your hospitality at the Lowy Institute these recent weeks and to Charlie for hosting me at CSIS uh, for the last three months in Washington. Um, and of course, the Thorley um, Scholarship is an opportunity to Immerse yourself uh, in these places and to and to develop a little bit of knowledge about something and and submarines has been uh, you know the topic uh, the chosen topic. So to answer the question, um, I think that the uh, the issue of nuclear submarines for the Australian Navy is very new to the public, uh, but less of a new topic to the Australian Navy. It's a capability that matches uh, and uh, Australia's requirements, Australia's needs, Australia's geography. Uh, something that has been thought about for a long time, uh, but a, 
particular will and a particular political configuration uh, is the most recent uh, change that we've seen. Um, so that is to say, Australia has been using uh, diesel powered uh, submarines in a way that uh, nuclear powered submarines are traditionally used, transiting long distances, pushing through a lot of water. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the, view, the view, view has been put to me that we have really reached the limits of the chemistry and the physics of what a uh, conventionally powered submarine can do, and it was simply gonna be insufficient for our future needs. Uh, there is also the issue of needing to snorkel, which is to say, uh, coming up close to the surface to run diesel engines and suck down air, um, that is a detection risk. Uh, it's a risk that in the decades to come uh, is going to be an un unacceptable one uh, and an unacceptable practice. Um, you know, and there are other aspects looking to the future with SSNs for Australia. So, uh, as well as um, the upgrades to the Collins class, which we expect will be receiving Tomahawk land attack missiles. Uh, the Virginia class submarine is, is obviously, uh, this, this will be a new capability for Australia um, that has some, raises some interesting questions. Um, but I think even further ahead, when people start talking about an autonomous future, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, um, I think we really need to step up in terms of this, this power source uh, because we need to be able to run this kind of mothership autonomous teaming. I think that's the future. Uh, and I think a, a nuclear power, uh, powered submarine is really crucial to that. I don't think it's something that we, we could really contemplate with a conventionally powered submarine. Mm. Just to amplify this point, um, the... the, the the issues really here, the advantages of nuclear power are uh, range and endurance, and it's really quite stark. I read a study myself just recently that um, uh, for a nuclear-powered submarine uh, operating from, uh, say, the west coast of Australia, the transit, to the, the transit time to the South China Sea would be roughly a third of what it would be for a diesel submarine. And once it's on station in the South China Sea, it could operate for something like 70 or 80 days whereas the endurance of a diesel-powered equivalent would be something in the order of two weeks or less. If I may jump in, I, I, it, it's a very popular kind of diagram that's done the rounds. It does uh, uh, omit the fact that Australia does, um, you know, pull into Singapore routinely, refuel and replenish. So it does have the ability to go further and to, and to sustain uh, on station for longer, but, but it is nonetheless true what you say. So the question we have to get to before the hour's out is why that's important for Australia to have those kind of capabilities. But Charlie, let me first turn to you and ask you about the, the response in Washington to all of this. So we, as I said in the introduction, this has absolutely dominated the, the, the public conversation in Australia, including the, you know, splashed all over the front pages of our newspapers for days. Uh, what about in the United States and in Washington in particular, beyond the, the direct uh, you know, policy and political circles that would naturally be involved in this. What has been the reaction? And then also, as a follow-up, uh, what, what's the, how would you describe the support level for AUKUS inside Congress? Because that's going to be very important going forward, right? Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the question, uh, Sam, but thanks very much to Lowy uh, for hosting. Uh, it's terrific to be back here. I, I'm here for three and a half days only, so I can pulse the very vibrant debate uh, that we're seeing here in Australia because it's not actually been as much of a debate uh, in the US thus far. Uh, a couple of different reasons. One, everything happens all at once. Uh, so the news cycle is sometimes drowned out by other things. Uh, we had a bank financial collapse uh, pending that didn't happen. So the, the news story when it broke in the US last Monday uh, was an enormous story for one day. And then it's submerged, if you allow me. We can play with this analogy all day long. The puns um, write themselves, Charlie. They do indeed. Look, I prepared for this by rereading 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So I am good to go, Sam. Um, but uh, it was a large story and uh, for one day, and then it's gone away. I would say a couple of further things on this. It, there is largely a wellspring of support uh, for this, uh, from Washington, from industry, uh, for people who read this. But there are lots of questions to be answered, just like there are here. Uh, and one of the ones that we'll talk about, I'm sure, is the United States has its own naval requirements, right? They are set about how many things we need. 
SSNs, SSBNs, we can use lots of analogies here, but how many capabilities we need to meet the objectives that we set for ourselves as a country. So the question is, will we still have the ability to get them because we've not been meeting the objectives? And will AUKUS now, will an infusion of investment by Australia, by the Brits, and by the United States into the submarine industrial base support the requirements that we already have? So that's a question that I think is uh, out there. But there's a larger part here um, that I think is resonating through the American public. Partially, this comes via Ukraine, uh, but I think it's a larger point at this uh, stage, too, that I think the American public, by and large, uh, despite the chest beating that you might see coming out of us, and we have lots of that, of course, uh, is acknowledged the fact that given the turn in geopolitical events, given the increasing concerns around Taiwan, given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that the United States wants its most trusted and most capable partners to be stronger than they have been in the past. So I think there is a turn away from what used to be called simply American primacy, right? We are going to be stronger than everyone else combined. And now there is, you're beginning to see a development of the thinking that given the way things have evolved in the global environment, America needs and indeed wants its allies to be stronger than they have in the past. So that is, I think, actually boosting this decision around Washington and then uh, more pervasively within the country too. Hmm. Um, Lavina Lee, this is not just a trilateral story, of course, but it goes far beyond Australia, the UK and the US. Can you take us through regional reactions to AUKUS? Sure. Um, you know, the AUKUS was originally announced about 18 months ago. So we were at that end process where they're now talking about the plans for the optimal pathway. Um, and at that point in time, there were countries in our region that expressed some um, concerns about AUKUS. And principally, they were uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, who have talked uh, about concerns about non-proliferation. Um, and recently, in, in, again, reiterated those same concerns, but also concerns about the idea that uh, in making this agreement that we might in fact be accelerating some kinds of arms race in the region. Now, um, there are a number of ways you can interpret this. Um, so in one way, you could say that they could have actually made a lot more of a fuss about it. Mm -hmm. um, that in fact, that whilst mentioning some of these concerns, they haven't actually been as loud and as consistent and vociferous as you might have expected. Mm. So I think we, we could actually take that as a positive sign that um, either we're doing the right kind of diplomacy. I think the first time around, it was a bit of a shock for everyone because there was all, all sorts of secrecy obviously involved in making such an announcement. But this second time around, uh, the government has been making a lot more uh, efforts to in advance talk to their regional counterparts to reassure them. Now, um, one of the aspects of this deal that um, doesn't get talked about as much is the nuclear proliferation aspects. Um, and if you're a nuclear proliferation um, expert or someone who's in that field, uh, I think you would have concerns about AUKUS. And I say that as someone who actually supports the AUKUS deal, um, but it is relying on an exception within the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty that allows for um, nuclear propulsion. Um, so it, it isn't banned under the NPT, but some would look at it as a, uh, a kind of against the spirit of the NPT, even if it's not against the letter of the NPT. Now, I think Australia and the AUKUS partners have done a good job, I think, in reassuring the region that we're not about to start reprocessing uranium or, um, in, sorry, enriching uranium or reprocessing plutonium. We're, we're not getting that technology. Uh, the, the fuel will be provided to us. We're not creating it ourselves. We won't have access to it. It will be in welded units that will last for the lifetime of the submarine, which is around 30 years. So we have to think about the waste aspect afterwards. That's a, that's a problem that we as a country have to think about, how we're going to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I think there are solutions. Um, but in terms of the proliferation aspects, there will be some who will still say it's, it's setting a precedent um, that there might be other countries, especially other nuclear weapon states, who might think, 
all right, well, why don't we do the same thing? We might have an ally or a, a very close partner that it might be advantageous for us um, to have a similar type of deal. Um, look, I, I think that um, the IAEA has come out, the Director General, and said that he is very satisfied, in fact, it was very glowing, about what Australia and the AUKUS partners have done um, in terms of uh, reducing proliferation risks. That's a very big positive. Um, but I also think that I think we just can't forget how, um, how unprecedented AUKUS really is and the likelihood that there really is another nuclear weapon state out there who would be willing to sell, not sell, but share uh, their crown jewels with, with another country. I, I would even wonder whether this no limits partnership between Russia and China would also right. go that far. So this is, a, this is a big deal. And so if we're talking about precedence, you still got to think about the likelihood that they will actually be um, followed through. Mm. And now your original question was about Southeast Asia. And what I would say, final comment about Southeast Asia is, um, it's kind of an open secret that Southeast Asians really respect power. So uh, they're very respectful of the United States. I think they internalize uh, the military modernization project that China has embarked on, which is the largest project of any country since World War II. They largely internalize it and accept it. And um, I think in terms of AUKUS, they will internalize and accept it. And I think there are a number of Southeast Asian countries that don't say it vocally, but they're actually happy that we are taking um, steps to bolster the, the balance of power in this, in this region. Um, and I think there's an acceptance. They know very well that ASEAN is a diplomatic and institutional forum, but it is not capable of providing that balance. So they look to us and I think they will actually treat us better um, because we're more capable. They'll actually look to do more with us in terms of defence cooperation than they ever did before. So when we hear Indonesia uh, express concerns about proliferation, we should read that as literally concern about proliferation and not as a proxy for a, a broader doubts about the, the, the strategic... Uh, aspects here and, and, and about Australia's growing military strength? I, I think that's the case. I mean, you, you very recently, I'm not sure, I can't tell you exact dates, but very recently we had announcements that Australia and Indonesia were moving forward to deepen their defence cooperation. And this was in the shadow of a, I think, maybe two weeks later, the AUKUS announcement was due. So I do think that they, they do have concerns, but I think those concerns can be placated and I think Australia, the UK and the US are doing as much as they can, I think, to do that. Mm. Charlie, you talked about a, a turn away from primacy towards uh, helping allies to develop their military capabilities. Um, that brings me to former Prime Minister Paul Keating's dramatic intervention last week in this uh, national debate, which I know you familiarised yourself with. Sure. Um, what's your response to the argument that America's, and I'm quoting Keating now, that America's geostrategic priority is to contain China militarily, economically, close quote, and that through AUKUS, Australia is effectively signing up to that ambition. Um, uh, I would say it was certainly a dramatic intervention uh, that Mr. Keating made. Uh, whether or not it is an effective intervention, we'll see as the debate plays out. Uh, look, I, I actually think that you have to start uh, by responding to that question from the point that Levina had just introduced that this was a dramatic announcement, uh, both 18 months ago and again last week, but it shouldn't be an altogether surprising one. The particulars, the details are, because this is a fairly natural, I would say, response by three nations to an unprecedented expanse, expansion by China. Levina said, the most explosive uh, exponential growth since World War II. Over the past two decades, three decades, right, we have seen the Chinese economy grow. We've seen them plowing money into military modernization. Uh, we've seen eight, uh, 13 new uh, submarines that the Chinese have put to sea over the past 15 years, several of which carry nuclear armed weapons, which Australia's will not. And we've seen not only a growing capability that is oftentimes opaque, right? You have to look pretty hard to understand what they're doing because they try not to advertise everything that they're doing. 
That is one thing, but it's the use with which that force has been put, right? Growing capabilities, abetting an expanding set of goals by China. To increasingly, and this is the easiest argument in the world to make here in Australia, intimidate, coerce, lean on, and occasionally attack China's neighboring states. The security environment has deteriorated and has been destabilized because of the actions that China has taken. This is not surprising that there has been a response. It's surprising that it's taken so long, I would say. So the fact that there is a dramatic response doesn't surprise me at all. One of the things that I look at when I'm watching how the press unfolds here uh, about what's happened with AUKUS is that just like the American press, sometimes we get a little parochial, right? Uh, that you look at what, happened, what is happening in Australia, absenting what's happening in larger contexts. Because Australia has, in the midst of really ramping up uh, what it's doing, we should note too that AUKUS is only one part of this, right? Uh, your government is in the midst of the Defense Strategic Review, which will be released in a month's time. AUKUS is only a part of where that is going to go. But this idea that the environment in which you live has been badly destabilized is not a decision that Australia is alone in recognizing or responding to. The Japanese, a pacifist country, have just announced that they are doubling their defense budget. Mm. Uh, the Philippines are ramping up what they are doing. The South Koreans have decided that they are going to start talking with their old nemesis, the Japanese, because they're worried about what is happening in their environment. Same with the Indians. These are all a set of responses to the same set of stimuli, right? An increasingly aggressive use of Chinese capabilities. So this strikes me as not containment, but a natural response to what has been involved <laughs> in this. I mean, I think Penny Wong talks about this regularly as strategic equilibrium that Australia is looking for. Because at this point, you were talking about the Southeast Asians' response to this writ large. Uh, the Philippines said, said uh, in response to the AUKUS announcement last week, that we are hoping that something like this begins to restore strategic equilibrium for us, and therefore we welcome it. So this strikes me as a pretty natural, if dramatic, response to what has been happening by China over the last two decades. I would, I would say that with perhaps the exception of Mr. Keating, I, I, I doubt it would be controversial in Australia that we would respond uh, with dramatic gestures of our own to the rise of Chinese military power. That, that seems completely natural, I would, I would say, to most observers. There is, of course, a different question about how we respond. Mm. And uh, Paul Keating's uh, uh, foreign minister at the time, Gar Gareth Evans, has come out saying that this is a pretty dramatic shift from a doctrine focused on the defence of Australia to one back to a forward defence strategy. Mm. Um, and I I've argued myself in the past that uh, capability can drive policy. What we have determines what we do. So if we buy submarines that are more or less expressly designed to operate thousands of kilometres to our north, then that's how we'll use them. So how do you respond to the argument that, that the, the capability in itself will drive Australia closer uh, to American foreign policy objectives on Taiwan, for instance? Look, you have said like 15 different things there, so we would probably have to take each one at a time before we get to the covert deal that your government has signed up to with the US, uh, as we heard this morning from Hugh White. Um, look, let me start by answering that, and then actually Justin, I think, can chime in as someone who knows yeah, the uh, capability really well. Uh, when you were talking at the outset, Sam, about what do SSNs, uh, right? It comes somewhat trippingly off the tongue. Mm. What do they give you? They give you range, <coughs> they give you power, but they also give you stealth in a way that diesel submarines don't. And I think, so let me draw back to the strategic angle. I think that this is a bet amongst other things by not just Australia, but by the United States and the UK as well. That if they look back, if all of our governments look back over the past two decades, not very much has deterred China, right? China thinks that they are operating in a very permissive security environment. And if you have a permissive security environment, you keep going. Now. As Richard Marl said just last week, when you have a stealthier capability, it increases the questions for Beijing. Where are they? What do they have the ability to do? And before you continue taking not only assertive actions, but potentially quite aggressive ones, 
this increases the complexity of the cost benefit analysis for Beijing. That is a good thing that we should want to increase. Right? We should want to increase the questions that reside in Xi Jinping's mind before he decides to roll the dice in a horrible way, be it in Taiwan or somewhere else. And so the stealthiness of these capabilities, these SSNs, is something that I think, and this is where we should probably get to the deterrence conversation, the bet here, at least as I read it, Sam, is that by bringing more capabilities online, not just for Australia, but increasing the capacity of all three of our nations, it creates more questions in Beijing's mind and begins to convince them that they are operating in a less permissive security environment, and that will ultimately stabilize the region more than it has been over the past decade. Mm. Justin? Uh, yeah, it's an it's a ongoing uh, um, desire of mine to, to, for, for the Navy and for the submarine community to talk more about what they do so that we can understand and appreciate it um, because, um, you know, I think that is affecting the kind of assumptions that people make. So the assumption that our current uh, conventionally powered submarines don't operate thousands of nautical miles away from our shore is incorrect. They can, they do, and have done. Uh, Australia's operated submarines uh, for more than 100 years um, in all sorts of places. Though, uh, as I say, um, accounts of what they do and where they go um, are tightly held. You know, defence would say that the more they say about what submarines do, the less value they will have, because obviously as much as Australian citizens, taxpayers and voters are interested, so are our adversaries. Um, I would submit uh, to them that they could, they could do a little bit better. They could perhaps tell us a little bit more. Um, and I look to the way our intelligence agencies, even in the last 10 years, have increased transparency and have worked to earn the social license uh, <coughs> of, what they, of what they do uh, by telling us a little bit more about uh, what they do year to year uh, might be a model uh, that defence could look at. Here, here, Lavina. Mm. So the yeah, original premise of the question was about containment, that mm. Australia was buying into a containment strategy by the US. Now, I mean, that word is always bandied about, but it's, it is a Cold War term that I don't think applies in this current environment. I think what we're really trying to do, is, in line with what Charlie's suggested already, is um, it's about constraining China's options. It's not containment. We, China is the uh, number one trading partner of a large number of states. I don't have the number, but a very large number of countries in the world have China as its major trading partner. We're not, uh, I don't think Australia is ever suggesting that we're not going to trade with China. Uh, there might be selective decoupling going on in terms of high technology, in terms of critical supply chains, but it is selective. And uh, the idea is not to contain China, but to, um, to shape its decisions. Um, and as Charlie, Charlie said, up, up until now, um, you can see, say, for example, um, in a period where um, our relations with China, when I say our United States relations with China were still very good, when Obama was in power, there was a, a lot of conciliatory kind of uh, moves uh, in, in around 2009 when we had the GFC. And then from that point on, you can see the steady expansion of uh, kind of aggressive behaviour um, by China. And up until now, there hasn't really been a steady response to that. So I think this is about sending a signal to China that we're improving our capabilities. Uh, it sends a big signal about resolve, um, that we, we are capable, but why are we doing this? I mean, it's such a, a dramatic announcement. You've got to, if you were China, you'd be, uh, there's a good reason why they're making so many uh, noises about it. Mm -hmm. So if it wasn't actually uh, an important thing and, an, and an, uh, I think a quantum leap in our um, defence capabilities and specifically our abilities uh, towards long-range strike, which we really don't have yet. We really have to develop those um, that ability to deter uh, with long-range strike weapons. So this is just one step. Uh, SSNs are an important step for all the reasons that you've already spoken about. Uh, in terms of their range, their stealth, um, you don't know where they operate, they can actually take out fleets. So they are a powerful um, tool. Um, and I think this is AUKUS Pillar 1, but we've got AUKUS Pillar 2, and that's where I think we'll even see more in terms of this development of a long-range strike capability, and that will be what will deter China 
the, the surest pathway to, to war is if China actually thinks it's easy to do. Hmm. So we're trying to make it not easy. Just before I open it up to the audience, I, I did want to go a little bit deeper into Pillar 2. And Justin, maybe you could describe what that term is and, what, and what's involved. Yeah, certainly. So when AUKUS was first announced, uh, nuclear-powered submarines was the first order of business. And then for reasons unclear to me, uh, every other advanced defence uh, capability under development was added. So I will miss some certainly, but hypersonics, counter hypersonics, unmanned underwater, quantum, cyber, space I think was added at one point. Uh, so that is to say, as part of, of this trilateral security pact, all of those other capabilities are on the agenda. Uh, those of us who paid close attention were listening uh, for any, any sign of that last week, uh, and we did not hear it. I would suspect that we will not see uh, a president and two prime ministers reunite uh, on stage to announce any of the particular developments that happen. Um, I, I, I think that there's a, a school of thought that says the combination of all of those other advanced technologies is as important, if not more important, than nuclear-powered submarines. Um, I like to think that there's a lot of overlap so I think that it's, it's a matter that uh, nuclear-powered submarines and all of those technologies are going to be speaking to each other in all sorts of interesting ways in these coming decades. Mm. Um, so I know that the, uh, there's a, a, a piece of regulation in front of the House uh, either last night or tonight uh, to uh, welcome the Secretary of State to Congress to report uh, regularly on the implement, implementation of AUKUS. And so that may be the forum in which we, we hear developments of that kind. Yeah. And that, that reminds me, Charlie, I don't think we got to the, the question I asked earlier about congressional support for mm. AUKUS, and in particular the, the initial part of, of the submarine agreement for the transfer of Virginia-class boats will require congressional approval, right? Yep. Uh, are there major sort of stumbling blocks towards that, or does that look like smooth sailing to you? Yeah, no, uh, look, this is, uh, we did address it, but I'll underscore. I'm sorry. No, 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 well, I'll underscore it a little bit more because when you, you know, uh, if you're, you know, a submarine nerd, and I guess all of us are now, you know, you're <laughs> looking eagerly to the fact sheets that was released after this dramatic announcement. And one of the things that kind of jumped off the page to me was the sale of three to five Virginia class submarines to Australia, right, to help cover that looming capability gap that Australia has, right, which was by the way, foreshadowed when we had Osmond, the ministerial meeting um, between Penny Wong and Richard Marles and their American counterparts in December, uh, one of the journos who was there asked, uh, well, how is Australia going to cover its capability gap? Uh, it's in front of us. The Collins class will not last. And Lloyd Austin, who's the U.S. Secretary of Defense, said, we will cover that gap. So that's the dramatic announcement that we saw. But the most important words in that, as you've rightly noted, were comma, pending congressional approval. Um, and what I had said earlier was uh, we have requirements in the United States, right, about if we have set objectives, which we lay out explicitly in our national security strategy, and then in our explicit and public national defense strategy, here are the resources you actually need if you're going to achieve those objectives. And it you know, goes all the way down into the weeds about this many attack class submarines, this many ballistic um, uh, uh, Ballistic submarines. Boomers. Boomers, thank you, SSBNs. <laughs> uh, but the requirement currently that the United States operates under is that it will produce three submarines per year. Two attack class, Virginia class submarines, and one boomer. Due to a number of factors, but COVID looms largest here, we are not achieving either of those objectives. I think depending on who you ask, we roll out, uh, we only have two shipyards that produce submarines. One's up in Connecticut, the other is down in Virginia. Uh, we produce either 1.4 or 1.7 submarine per year. Uh, and so the pending congressional approval is, uh, I think there is support as we have seen from multiple letters and multiple uh, members, and it's bipartisan, uh, by the way, uh, assuming that we hit not only that two submarines, two attack class submarines per year, but go over that. And I think really what, one of the things that I take away from the surprise announcement last week is it's the decision to invest by all of us in ourselves and in each other with the idea that this gets us to net positive, way beyond what we're producing currently. Yes, Australia way down the road 
Britain a little bit more quickly, and America much more quickly. Mm -hmm. So that is the stumbling block about how quickly we can scale up uh, before we begin delivering these to ourselves and to Australia. Okay, great. Let's, let me open it up. Um, if you could raise your hand. Um, yes, please. Trevor, uh, please wait for the microphone. Trevor Rowe, <clears throat> my concern is that this announcement is, is dramatic, <clears throat> pardon me, and, and if I look forward a few years, I see elections here in Australia, I see elections in the United States, and I see considerable uncertainty as to those outcomes. What impact does this have? Secondly, in Australia, I don't think the public's got any idea that we have a Labor government here that's an interventionist government, big programs on welfare and the like, plus the existing military commitments alongside AUKUS now, that this nine billion annually that's gotta be found over three decades, looks a challenge. Now, obviously we don't know what the components are and how this will be done, private sector partnership for whatever. But the point being, I don't think that's been sufficiently articulate. The average Aussie doesn't like tax increases anyway. Same with and, the average American, by the way. No, <laughs> more course. so. <laughs> and and, and we, we've, got, we've got already a, a retrograde tax system. So we need tax reform as well. So a lot on this, this creates a lot of items on our agendas, both in the US and Australia. And so I'd be interested in your reviews of what happens in the US and longer term and what happens in Australia in the longer term, because I don't think this is going to look like what it looks like now in the longer Thank term. You. Uh, well, who would like to take that on? I, I could tackle, I'm not going to tackle that. I'll leave you and Justin to the American side of the equation. Um, look, I, I do think there's a lot of risks in this uh, pathway. So they, they've done it in a way um, that at least we're purchasing off the shelf submarines. And as we know, we don't seem to be very good at one deciding what we want uh, when it comes to submarines, changing our minds, um, but also just delivering defense projects on time and on budget. So I think we're all in agreement that there's big risks here. Um, now, we might try and reassure ourselves that this is such a big deal that all three countries will be really wanting this to work because it's, it's actually going to send a terribly, uh, a terrible message um, to the region and to China. I know we, they, uh, governments don't like to mention the C word, um, but we've made this big announcement. We're talking about an exponential leap in our capabilities. If we can't actually do it, that actually signals that we're pretty weak. Um, so I think all for all of our three countries will be putting as much resources into making this work as, pos as much as possible. Now, I do also think, I agree with you, when you think about the pipeline of uh, the, the 368 billion, um, initially when I heard that number, I thought, what a strange way of announcing this. Um, to give you a forward number going into 2050, um, with so many moving parts that it's actually just an estimate. Nobody really knows how much it's going to cost. So I think in a lot of ways they probably made it sound worse than it might be. We don't know whether there'll be economies of scale that might make it actually less expensive than that. But put that aside, um, I think that it's eminently possible that we don't necessarily, and you guys might disagree with me, we might end up with the three to five Virginia class boats and we might decide that we don't do the next stage. Um, and that's a decision for future governments given their cost-benefit analysis of what money we really have at that point. Um, if I can jump in too. Please. I'd say yeah. we actually have some data to begin answering your question, right? That uh, we've had uh, a change uh, in government here that it, and the new government is just as supportive as your prior government. Uh, we haven't had a change of government in the UK, but you've had the change of leaders and then the change of leaders and then the change of leaders, but they're all still supportive of it. Uh, the question mark here is obviously the United States uh, because we haven't had a change in leadership or a change in government yet, but we have looming elections in front of us. Uh, look, uh, I do not do horse race betting on the US and I'm not gonna tell you who's gonna win in 2024. What I can say uh, about this is that, uh, look, I'm the inaugural Australia chair at my institution, but also anywhere in Washington. And I can tell you, because I talk about Australia a lot, obviously with the wrong accent, uh, that there is a wellspring of support right now for Australia, the likes I don't think I've ever seen before. And it is bipartisan. 
Um, that's important when we talk about this pending congressional approval. I'll also say at a larger level that uh, Democrats on the left and Republicans on the right, and particularly as you move further out to the extremes, both want America to have more powerful and more capable, very trusted allies, oftentimes for very different reasons. And that is not necessarily going to give us the answer for whether or not AUKUS will be supported forever, depending on who the president happens to be. Uh, we haven't seen any statements by any of the potential candidates about AUKUS, but it does tell us that there's a lot of support for this. The final point I would say on the Australian side of the equation is when I've been listening to all the statements that have been made uh, by political leadership here, the one that struck me as quite resonant uh, was the deputy prime minister, who I think over the weekend had said, uh, look, costs are large, but we're also a very rational people. And when you're doing your assessments, the one thing I think everyone agrees on is that our security has deteriorated, suggesting that we need to pay into the system more to make sure that there's more stability uh, in the region. And I would simply say in the US too, there is a recognition, especially with the war in Ukraine, that we do not have enough of what we need to deter our adversaries, right? Uh, we have given an enormous amount to the Ukrainians who are using it valiantly, and we don't have enough left. And so just the defense budget that was proposed by the president two days before AUKUS came out suggests an enormous amount of investment into our industrial capabilities to make sure that we have more armaments than we have right now. Hmm. Again, I can't predict idiosyncrasies. <laughs> uh, Andrea, just in the... Uh, Chris Skinner, one quick comment and then a question. Um, I think that Australia shows its immaturity by continually harping on some big number for 30 years, hence spending. Hmm. Uh, in the US, they take a much more mature view and look at things incrementally. They have a long-term estimate by all means, but they don't assume it's all or nothing. They uh, re uh, evaluate it every year, Congress uh, reviews it, and they change their mind as they go along. And I would say that, yes, there's been a poor track record in Australia of achieving defence programs, but often that's because the strategic environment has changed and the government has responded accordingly. My question though is, Rather than dwell on a big $368 billion, surely a much more uh, important statistic is the 0.15% uh, of GDP, which it represents over the 30 years. And that actually, compared with increasing our defence spending, that's actually quite reasonable, wouldn't you agree? Um. I would say uh, the, the thought that comes to mind are, are, are two particular quotes. Um, one is, uh, as was said of Australia many decades ago, um, Australia is a great country, but there's too many journalists and not enough news. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable in saying that as a, as a, a long-time journalist myself. So um, it's almost inevitable that a number uh, like that is going to be overly focused on. But... You know, the other quote that comes to mind is, price is what you pay, value is what you get. It's a Warren Buffett quote. And so I come back to this notion of trying to understand better, um, you know, this, this indeed, it is a huge number, but a huge strategic bonus as well. I acknowledge my um, shipmates from HMAS Adelaide who are here today. Um, you know, I was on an academic uh, sea ride with them back in November. Uh, it's a program the Navy runs to make sure that academics and others can really see what happens uh, with life in the Navy. And I think it gave me a particular uh, appreciation for some of the awesome capabilities that we have and some of the fantastic people uh, and platforms that we deploy all the time. And I think around this really large number, there's a, an old narrative that Australia is somehow incapable or we're not up to it uh, or you know, it's going to be dud subs all over again, for those of you that are they're old enough to remember that phrase, right? And I think that uh, it's time to grow up. Uh, it's time to say that it is a big number and it is a big capability and we can do it. Uh, it's a moment to really pull the sword out of the stone 
uh, and, uh, and I think there's a great resolve uh, to see it succeed. Um, so I think we should be confident. Mm. Lavina. Well, look, I think um, events like this are important. In I think the government so far hasn't necessarily made the case for why they're doing what they're doing. Why do we need to spend 0.15? Um, I think we were speaking earlier about um, a lot of the announcements are about how many jobs are being created or, you know, industrial bases. That, that's all important. Don't get me wrong. It's not a bad thing for Australia to get another 20,000 uh, jobs in South Australia and elsewhere. That's, that's not a bad thing. But I think they need to make a stronger case for why uh, or what they understand to be a deterioration in our strategic environment. Um, I think, you know, whilst you don't want to be alarmist as, a, as to the risks of war in our region, um, the risks of war are real. And we are in a period where we have a chance to deter that from happening. We, as we've mentioned earlier, we, we've looked at um, the steady expansion of Chinese military capabilities that are, that are actually more extraordinary than, I think they've almost become normalised. We don't, we don't really even blink an eye um, when we hear about it anymore. Um, but we've got to ask ourselves, what, what are they going to be using all of those capabilities for? And we have to listen to, I think, President Xi when he talks about what he wants to use those military capabilities for. Um, and I think uh, maybe about three weeks ago, you had the head of the CIA uh, report that the intelligence agencies, or his intelligence agency had, had um, gathered intelligence that Xi had said to, that his military should be ready uh, to use its forces in Taiwan by 2027. So we should take these things seriously. And um, I think the government, even though they don't like to use these, uh, the C word, um, there has to be a strong justification for spending this kind of money. And I think they need to make that justification a bit clearer. So let me play the devil's advocate briefly for all, all three of you. Um, we can say the C word and there is China, it's just it's just <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and and uh it's uh again as i said earlier there's no question uh about the scale of the military build up it seems to be um, mr keating only who is uh who is not concerned about that and yet we're a long way away um one stat i often throw out into the public debate is that beijing's closer to london than it is to sydney so why this for Australia? What is the argument for this as opposed to some other capability? Why would Australia uh, take on the task of essentially defending our nation from the South China Sea rather than do it closer to our shores? Uh, well, I think, um, you know, one of the ways that Navy would put it is that uh, you can use submarines to defend your ports. You can use submarines to uh, defend choke points a little bit further away, or you can use submarines to, uh, you know, in, in operations where your adversary is. So if we're talking about China and we're talking about the potential of an amphibious attack across the Taiwan Strait, uh, yeah. you know, literally the most complicated, most risky military operation that you can commit to, one that China has never done, right? Uh, then there is one type of capability that is uh, really important there, and that's undersea, that's submarines. So during my time at CSIS, I was adjacent to the excellent war game that was, that was uh, published uh, by that organisation. And they made clear that attack submarines were one of two capabilities that were decisive in the United States being able to defend Taiwan. So it's, it's plain as day what they're capable of. That is not to say that Australia has made any pre-commitments, uh, but it is equally to say that Australia is uh, strengthening itself so that it has options. Uh, you know, the, the corollary would be to say uh, to weaken ourselves, uh, to forestall options uh, would, would be quite cowardly in the circumstances. N not a pre-commitment, Justin, but it does imply that the security of Taiwan is a vital security interest for Australia. And many people believe so. Mm. Many people believe that uh, a democracy of 25 million people uh, in our region is something to defend uh, and believe that uh, the, the loss of credibility uh, to America, should it not defend or seek to defend or successfully defend that, 
uh, would affect us. Hmm. Can I um, dive in? So first of all, I, I just I, I disagree with your point, Sam, that acquiring this capability is an implied commitment to Taiwan. The U.S.-Australian alliance is a partnership. Partners work out what would be used. I take the deputy prime minister and your prime minister at the word when they say when there's an Australian flag hoisted over those, they have full control of where they are going. But let me step back uh, for a second to make a broader point, I think, on this, because I think you've hit on a really key debate <laughs> here about what is the correct posture orientation and therefore strategy uh, for Australia. Is it just defense of Australia or is it something that looks a little bit more forward into the region? I would just say that there's an assumption that if you mind your own business and just have the ability to defend yourself, it shouldn't really matter what else happens. And that all this talk that we've been having about a deteriorating security environment, it looks really bad, but it probably won't affect Australia in any way, shape, or form. And I don't think that's true. In fact, I think we, again, have evidence for this, that we've seen this. And again, I look, I am a historian by training. I'm sorry if I evoke the 20th century, but we've run this play more than once before, where if you just seek to batten down the hatches, make yourself a little bit more prickly or spiky or echidna-like, right? We have lots of analogies here. You hope that you can weather the storm. That is not conducive, I don't think, to the environment or to the flourishing of a country's interest. Now, I, again, I say I think because I'm not Australian. I will say there's a different version of this debate that happens in America. And I will say that over and over again, we have run this tape before, not once, but twice in the 20th century. And an inward looking, slightly hold your adversaries off a little bit, does not deter adversaries. And in fact, I would say from historical evidence, invites further aggression. Mm. Alina? Yeah, I, you know, this um, idea that Defence of Australia is where we should be, um, I find it hard to reconcile in the sense that um, we're a trading nation. Around 99% of our, our trade um, comes by sea. Uh, so I just, I thought of maybe it's the hypothetical that we should think to ourselves. If we batten down the hatches, um, if, for example, the United States chose to batten down the hatches as well, um, we would know that China would dominate this region. There is really no other uh, possibility if the United States is not here, if the United States is not willing to play that role, that balancing role. Uh, we, can, we can play some part of that role, but we really need the United States to be here. Um, and we need to play our part as well. Um, so I think the idea that we can simply just defend our territory, defend our near shores, um, that's not just where our interests lie. And I just invite you to think about um, if we did have a Chinese-dominated uh, region, um, can we really assume that things just go on as normal, that we will just go on um, selling our iron ore to China, China will pay a market price, and not a price that they choose to pay, um, or that we will be able to uh, enact laws in our country about foreign interference without suffering some kind of coercive uh, pressure from the outside. I think we have to think about these things, that it's not just about defending our territory. Our interests are much bigger than that, mm. um, and that we have to play our part in that. Otherwise, we, we have to consider what life might be like. Mm. All right, we have time for a couple more. Uh, right at the front here, Andrea. Uh, Colin Clark, uh, Indo-Pacific Bureau Chief for Breaking Defense. It looks like AUKUS is going to be even bigger than the Snowy scheme. Immigration has been a huge issue the last 10 years. You don't have the bodies for your own economy now, and you need nuclear experts, you need highly trained welders, there are already 70,000 short of those. How is Australia going to do this? That's an excellent question. Justin uh, <laughs> might be outside my remit, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't have the answer to that. You've identified a really big challenge. 
Um, and indeed, if you are to ask tough questions of AUKUS, it does come beyond this question of top line cost into opportunity cost. Uh, and so uh, those people can be found and they can be trained uh, and they can be welcomed into the country, but they won't be doing all sorts of other productive, useful things. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's undoubtedly a big challenge. It's one of the things we hope uh, to hear more from the government about. Hmm. I think, it, look, when we're talking about AUKUS, it's a long-term plan. Um, we've got, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, you might be optimistic and you might think, okay, because there is a forward plan, then we can also, you know, the, the people who are going to man our AUKUS SSN um, are probably in kindergarten. So there's a, a long period of time where we could potentially incentivize people to build those skills, go to the right universities to learn about physics and nuclear physics. Um, I had a friend at university who was a physicist who did a PhD in physics and then finished his degree and had no job prospect. So, I mean, this could be a, a really big deal for a lot of um, scientific communities in, in Australia. I know that's a, a, not necessarily answering your question, but I think think about the fact that it is a long-term plan. So we do have the ability to plan ahead. I'll just say that uh, I just came up uh, from a couple of days in Canberra and the full uh, attention and focus seems to be on the enormous endeavor that this is and whether or not it is yet translated into action plans and therefore budgets across a variety of agencies that haven't yet touched this, right? Obviously, defense has had a large part in this, but because this is such a large uplift, immigration plays a role, as you were saying. Education, the Department of Education, the Department of Health, all of these departments and agencies will touch this in various forms, not to mention the state governments too, if we're talking about the enormous bills that are going to start occurring today, uh, thereabouts, out in WA, no less down in um, uh, South Australia too. So government seems to be focused on this, but then pushing forward to make sure that it translates out into this and has the budgets and uplift is I think the work ahead. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll have to, we'll just keep it to one question. We, we have time for one more, and I've noticed all the hands have been male up to this point. <laughs> Always a problem. Thank you very much for our final question. If you wait for the microphone. Just a simple question. It's a C word. Um, what, regarding the timing of Xi Jinping's uh, visit to Russia, and his talk with Putin. What is what is the real motivation behind that? And what is the message that he's trying to project to the world about it? Well, we're a little bit off AUKUS, but if anyone wants to uh, intervene on that one. No, go. <laughs> um, look, this is the manifestation. Uh, my read of this uh, is this is the manifestation of that no limits partnership that we heard about right before the Olympics and right before Russia invaded Ukraine. And as Russia has fared so much more poorly in this war than everyone thought they would, they have an ally, they have a friend, and they have a backer. Uh, that's, I think, the message of that. In addition to Xi Jinping making a play that only he can help a peace plan, which, by the way, looks exactly like the peace plan that uh, Putin himself would draft. That's what I take from the meeting that we just saw. Mm. In fact, we do have time for another one. Yes, please. Thank you. Lloyd Brumfield. Um, notwithstanding all the uh, discussion about, you know, the finance, the politics, the workforce, etc. Being a technologist, I want to go back to the uh, basis of AUKUS and uh, one of the principal benefits of a nuclear-powered submarine is stealth. Okay, we're, we're talking now. This is technology now. In the decades to come, there's going to be development in sensing under the water, and I've seen at least one study it says the ocean is going to be transparent. So what's the utility of our nuclear-powered submarines then? Yeah, it's a, it's a phrase that uh, has been around for a while uh, and the oceans remain not transparent. Uh, you know, so, so that is to say 
uh, the oceans are, a particular undersea environment is a particular environment unlike anything else that we understand. So you can have a radar going through air and it, it kind of can see things and show you. Undersea is completely different. There's levels of water, there's density, there's salinity, there's noise bouncing off things. It's, it's incredibly complicated. I have heard uh, you know, some fanciful kind of things in the media in the last few days about how transparent the oceans are suddenly gonna become. It's something that serious people look at and think about. Over decades, there's a contest between offensive and defensive, and that will continue. So the submarines as they are now uh, are not as they will be in the decades to come. Um, but at the moment, uh, and historically, the submarines, uh, you know, stealth has been a key advantage and finding submarines, detecting them incredibly hard. Um, and so we can expect that in the near future, but as I say, over the middle, longer term, it, it, it will be a contest. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We've run out of time for today. We appreciate you coming as always and supporting the Lowy Institute's work. Uh, plenty more events coming up, so please keep an eye on, uh, on your, your email and on our website for the moment. Thank you very much for your attendance today and your interest, and uh, we wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.